the recording on and we're on. So the, the subject for us to discuss today is, is uh, criticizing Israel anti-Semitic. Anti uh, let me give you the definition from, uh, from the dictionaries of anti-Semitism. Like for example, it's host, uh, hostility toward or discrimination against Jews as a religious, ethnic, or racial group. Now, uh, I read it again. Uh, Anti-Semitism anti is a hostility toward, uh, toward or discrimination against Jews as a religious, ethnic, or racial group. So now, the question for us to discuss is criticizing Israel anti-Semitic. Um, it's not a pogrom by itself, for sure. So it's not uh, like an, uh, by itself an action against Jewish people, but could it be a hostility toward? Discrimination, uh, it's hard to imagine, but let's probably concentrate our discussion more on hostility. So criticizing Israel. And now I, I don't, uh, I, uh, oh, well, let's include everything. Uh, like for example, Jewish people, they, uh, they don't have rights to live in the land of Israel. And for example, Israel is uh, apartheid, Israel is uh, very racistic, anti-Arab and uh, inhumane uh, state. Uh, and the government of uh, Israel is uh, too conservative, I mean, for those who are not conservative. Uh, and uh, the settlements are wrong and the treatment of Palestinians uh, is wrong. And again, I'm not commenting on that. I'm even, I, I'm trying to say it in the way uh, I usually hear it. It's not, not, it's not necessary like very like, uh, it's the way that I'm telling my view or my opinion on that. But when we hear some things like this, uh, Let's talk about uh, sort of hus uh, hostility in all this. Is there any hostility? And uh, let's divide it in two parts, if, if we may. One is theological, so uh, who has rights for the land and does Israel, do Jewish people have rights for the land of Israel? If, if not, so is it hostility toward Jewish people and uh, also political? Uh, anti-Israel uh, or Israel cri criticizing Israel. So, what do you think? And uh, don't be don't be afraid to say something. Uh, I have a question. Or yeah. A it seems to me that when Jewish people discuss among themselves Jewish things, um, um, it seems okay. But when non-Jewish people ask um, or inquire about Jewish things, the concept of anti-Semitism comes up. Uh, and I bring that back to even when we look in scripture or if you look at the tradition of Jewish people, you ask, you answer questions with questions or you ask questions and you respond with questions. Jesus even did it in the Bible. But when people who aren't Jewish do that, they're questioning about whether they're anti-Semitic or not. But when Jewish people do it one with another, that question doesn't seem to come about. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, there is a very substantial uh, distinction or difference between Jewish people talking about Jewish people and Gentiles talking about Jewish people, uh, generally. That's why uh, some of you know my advice to, uh, uh, Jew to non-Jews, to Gentiles, uh, in talking to Jewish people, uh, avoid telling Jewish jokes. Or avoid telling Jewish jokes uh, to another Gentile while Jewish people are present in the room. We, as Jewish people, will love Jewish jokes, but Jewish sense of humor, we laugh about ourselves. We don't laugh about other people so much. So we don't laugh about Gentiles, but we laugh about ourselves. It's, it's our survival skill. 
we know that if we laugh about ourselves, we uh, we can uh, we can go through the troubles easier. So humor helps. Uh, so Jewish jokes they're about Jewish people, mostly, or to a substantial part. But when somebody else, not Jew, tells a Jewish joke, somehow subconsciously we take it as an offense because it's about Jewish people. You're not one of us. Why you're talking like this about us? Why you're making fun of us? You're not one of us. That was also a problem with, uh, with the New Testament uh, take, or, or the way Jewish people take the New Testament. For example, Jesus uh, sometimes sounds like anti-Semite, like somebody who actually speaks against Jewish people, but he was not doing that. It was inside Judaism or inside Jewish nation dialogue. So he was talking as a Jew to other Jewish people. It was not taken anti-Semitic the same as uh, Isaiah's comments in the book of Isaiah could not be taken anti-Semitic. But if a, like a Christian preacher, non-Jewish preacher, reads the word of G words of Jesus that are anti Pharisees, anti-Jewish, uh, or like he, uh, our, his blood is on us and our children. It, it sounds completely different. It sounds like, uh, like an offense. That's why, Janine, it's, uh, it's completely correct uh, what uh, your assumption, what you just uh, mentioned. If uh, Jewish people talk about Israel, we criticize everything there. We could just, well, we can talk about uh, Jewish politics uh, and negatively, but it's different from if somebody else, you know, a Gentile, speaks like this. It's pretty natural. And uh, uh, those of us who went through the history of uh, discrimination, uh, oppression, uh, troubles among other people, uh, it leaves a historic memory in us that impacts our relationship with the outside, with the world around us. And uh, so Jewish people, we also, wear, uh, we also carry this trauma of the past with us. Um, I was talking to a Jewish person recently in light of politics going on today, and I'm not gonna go into detail, but they were saying that as a person of color, you can't relate what's happening in politics today to what happened in the Holocaust in Germany. And, you know, they were wondering, it was I anti-Semitic by even trying to bring a correlation between what's happening now in the United States with politics and what may have happened in Germany and what led to happening with the Jewish people. And they said, you're not Jewish, so you can't talk about that. And be careful, you might be deemed anti-Semitic, but this was a Jewish brother in Christ, so they knew who I was in Christ. But they said, you, you should be very careful having conversations about trying to um, make correlations between the two. Yes, I would, I would highly, uh, I would agree with that. I would be highly sensitive because for Jewish people, Holocaust, it's an identity marker, a very substantial identity marker. And uh, Holocaust for us is not a Holocaust, it's the Holocaust. So there is no comparison. It's, uh, but it doesn't, have, it doesn't have much to do with people of color or not color. It just with everybody who is not related directly to the Holocaust and to the Jewish people, it's, uh, it's just like, it's a different story. You see, so uh, 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 what I mean, it's not uh, Janine because, uh, because of color or because of ethnicity. It just, Jewish people, they, they have an identity marker, the Holocaust. And uh, suddenly there can be a party, there can be uh, uh, oppression of uh, other people, there, there can be genocide of different uh, other nations, but the Holocaust is the Holocaust. You see, you see, so it's not, it's not like to compare. I think that if, uh, you know, it, so uh, I, 
if many people, they had their troubles and problems and tragedies uh, in history. And every nation cherishes this memory. Oh, many nations cherish this memory. It impacts us. It leaves some scars in us. And we go through our life with these scars even subconsciously. And it makes us too sensitive. And if we want to communicate with each other and build bridges to, uh, to each other, we need to, uh, we need to pay attention to this sensitivity. So I would agree with, uh, with your Jewish uh, brother. And yeah. It kind of makes me think of like the, the expression of like, I can pick on my brother, but you can't pick on my brother. Kind of like that familial relationship and kind of understanding of, you know, like you're, when you're in your family, you know what is acceptable and what is not acceptable, but also kind of what you're talking about with the Israelites is like the ability to empathize and the reality is that we don't have that ability to empathize. Right. And that's why uh, the Bible says, so, uh, like, be, in, be sorry or suffer with those who suffer. Uh, what, uh, what also means, uh, in, like, when somebody is in mourning, just be in mourning with him. Or just, like, try to share the burden in the way that I'm so sorry. It breaks my heart. I mean, when, I hear, uh, when, uh, when you hear about the Holocaust uh, and, somebody is, uh, and people suffered, it should break our heart. If we uh, hear about slavery, it should uh, break our heart. It's just like, it's not to compare, it's just to have compassion, to have uh, sorrow, to have some grief, and to, be, uh, to uh, suffer with those who suffer, even emotionally. I'm not talking just about like joining somebody to, on a journey to a concentration camp. No, uh, I'm talking about like uh, just emotional suffering. We need to participate in that. And I compare that with uh, if somebody dies uh, and, for example, somebody loses a child who, was, uh, who died of drugs. You can come and, and talk to, this, uh, to, uh, to the parent and say, you know, your son is, uh, uh, it's his fault. He shouldn't be using drugs. Would it help to the parents? No, nobody could come to this idea. I mean, nobody insane mind would come to this idea. So we would, uh, we would come and we would say sorry. We would, we would hug this person. We would sit with this person and just be sorry with this person. So when we talk, when we talk about Holocaust or troubles of any people who went through genocide uh, or oppression or discrimination, whatever, it's our place to... Uh, try to understand, try to have compassion and try to be sorry with, not to compare with our... So for example, if I come and say, oh, Jotna, you have, yeah, you lost your child. And by the way, I lost also something or something. Would it help? No. So just, uh, uh, sorry, it's not directly related to what you said. Yet you just, your comment was pretty excellent. I'm just elaborating a little bit more uh, on that, okay? So, but back to our, uh, based upon what we said, let's get back to criticizing Israel and anti-Semitism. Talk, uh, just, Dr. let's keep talking. Dr. Pickman, so I guess for me, I wonder, and I, I'm not really taking a stance, I'm just wondering where, if we should, should we draw a line between geopolitical Israel and ethnic Israel universal, meaning could somebody, I'm asking, I'm not saying, could somebody criticize geopolitical Israel for uh, decisions they're making? Not, I'm not even talking about the land. I think Israel geopolitically and ethnically has rights to the land, but if they were to make some incredibly immoral decision geopolitically, could we criticize the nation state but not be being anti-Semitic necessarily, or do you think either way it's still anti-Semitism? With other words, could you uh, criticize like geopolitically uh, without uh, being uh, hostile to Jewish people? Right, yes. Okay, fair and good question. Let's talk about that. So don't just ask also. <laughs> 
tell you and uh, speak your mind a little. I think oh, I'll, since I brought it up, I'll share and then let somebody else say something. I think I think we can, but I think we also it's not as easy as just saying yes because I don't think we can criticize when it comes to the rights to the land because I think Scripture already tells us that they have rights to the land. So the the Palestinian Israeli conflict I think is already settled in Scripture. But if Netanyahu were to come up with some other terrible decision that, you know, was maybe, I just can't think of something, maybe um, killing, maybe he just started killing his own people, then I would say, yeah, we can criticize him for that. Um, so I think you can to some degree, but it just depends on what it is. Okay. Who else? Don't wait for me just to, uh, to respond. Just tell you, speak your mind. I just wanted to add that sometimes I think the problem with this is that some people don't, do not really have the context to differ, differentiate uh, as to whether someone is being, in other words, when one is critical about something that has taken place in the political arena, or any other place that it's not necessarily anti-Semitic, there are those who will use that as ammunition to point to the fact that Israel is bad, uh, Jewish people are bad, anything they do or do not do is bad, therefore they don't have a right to the land or they can just build on that. So the danger is the world that we live in, the context in which we live in, people do not know how to differentiate. And you find this also in the church. So I think this is where the danger comes in and, and we need to uh, really uh, be clear in the way we communicate what we want to communicate so that we can demonstrate that it's not that we are approving of everything uh, that is taking place in Israel or everything that a Jewish person does but that it doesn't necessarily have to fall into what I think people consider to be anti-Semitism against a people in general for what people are doing that may not align with our morality or what we believe is righteous according to a biblical worldview. So with, uh, with other words, uh... If we, uh, if we look at uh, the biblical perspective on that, uh, actually we, sh uh, we, we should name wrong things by names on one side. On another side, well, yeah, keep talking. It sounds like what you're saying is, are we criticizing Israel because they're Jewish? Or are we criticizing Israel geopolitically because of a moral decision that's being made, not just on the basis of them being Jewish or not? Is that right? So, and the answer? I guess, now, going back to the question was, remind me of the question we're discussing. It was, <laughs> is criticizing Israel anti-Semitic? Okay. <laughs> so, uh, and what are you criticizing them for? Well, for uh, for treatment of Palestinians, for example. If you read the news or talk to people, you can uh, you can see the uh, the points Israel is usually criticized for. I don't want to talk too much, so I'll be quiet after this. I think it is anti-Semitic to criticize Israel over the Palestinian conflict. I do. Why? Because I think if we compare what Israel does in her, in her situation with um, maybe other nations in their situation, nobody criticizes other nations for doing similar things when they want to go to their own homeland. But because it's Israel, we criticize Israel. For whatever reason, 
Israel can't have her homeland, but other people can have their homeland. Um, and so it seems anti-Semitic in, in nature to me, um, just on that basis. And then also because they have, it is their land by scriptural right. They're supposed to have the land from the river to the Mediterranean and, and everything. So I think for those two reasons. Okay, so it's more like theological reason, right? Okay. Um, for myself, um, trying to operate from a biblical, theological worldview, it's difficult for me to try and uh, criticize Israel uh, in anything Israel does, because I don't know, I feel like I'm not an Israelite. Um, I mean, other than spiritual, you know, Gentiles adopted in kind of thing. But outside of that, from a national perspective, I don't feel like I know enough about Israel to criticize um, what's happening and this dispensation of time with Israel. And for example, like, let's say sometimes you read Old Testament prophets, like, let's take, I wrote a paper about Habakkuk in one of my BTS classes. And during that time, um, the Israelite people were um, um, in captivity by someone else, by God's design. And God told them to stand on the, he, and Habakkuk said, I'm gonna stand on the rampart. And God said, wait for the vision, it'll come. You know, I don't know in what dispensation of time God is choosing to uh, punish Israel for their inability to do right by what God's will is. And so they're in a, a kind of state of disciplinary action by God, you know, by Abba Father. So who am I to say that at this point, although I know um, ultimately there's going to be a new Jerusalem and the land belongs to Israel, who am I to say that in this dispensation of time that God is not somehow um, disciplining Israel um, until they will repent and um, obey better. I don't know enough about Israel, at least from where I am in my walk with Christ, to be critical. But I find sometimes in me trying to be more aware so that I can be prayerful because we're told to pray for Israel, that I can be called anti-Semitic for just trying to learn more about what's happening so I can maybe pray more intelligently for what's happening with the Israelite people. So sometimes you have that, um, that problem that takes place. You can be labeled as someone who's criticizing Israel when really all you're trying to do is become more informed so that you can pray or play whatever part God would have you to play um, for the people of Israel. And that's kind of what I add to it. And I really like what Michael had to share about, you know, there is a difference between a geopolitical and a national perspective on Israel. And, and like Helen said, everybody doesn't know the distinction or actually, actually operates from that. Or if you're talking with them, from which aspect they're really referring. So it can be, it can be delicate and difficult. And that's why I enjoy conversations with people, like our Jewish friends or groups like this so that I can learn and become more informed about how I can be prayerful or financially give or, or do whatever you can for, um, for Israel which you, and, and allow is, uh, Israelites to kind of be and do what God has called them to be. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, yeah, great. And let me, let me comment on, uh, on something, what you mentioned if I may, uh, God, so it's, it's God's business to uh, punish Israel or to deal with Israel in different dispensations or different stages or different periods of time. Um, but if God is not happy with the Jewish people in certain, for certain things, it's not, an, uh, it, it doesn't give right to other nations to exercise anti-Semitism. It's like with, it's like with, uh, with Jesus back then. He said uh, about his crucifixion or, and about his death that he goes the way God wants him to go. 
but uh, but uh, pain is the one who is initiating that so uh, that's why god uh, can also in the history i'm not talking about the future but in the past god was punishing jewish people through their or by their enemies but it was bad for the enemies the enemies never been good so anti-semitism doesn't have right in any dispensation so it's wrong in any dispensation disregarding of uh, how uh, god uh, decides to treat jewish people in this particular season so that's uh, i know that you uh, that uh, that it's it was not meant by you i just decide i uh, i wanted to emphasize this uh, in addition so other uh, other ideas but let me uh, let me uh, look at that from it or just suggest to look at that from a little bit different perspective any type of hostility is not necessarily universal but felt by a particular person or particular group of people so when we talk about anti-semitism as hostility toward jewish people uh, should uh, what matters the way Jewish people uh, receive that or feel this, or the way others feel that. If somebody tells something about Jewish people, he might, like with a Jewish joke, he might mean it good, but it could be received as a hostility. That makes the issue even more complicated. Because could it be described, so a joke told about Jewish people could be received by the Jewish people as a, as a sign of hostility, of anti-Semitism, even if somebody who does it is not anti-Semitic or not motivated by anti-Semitism. You see the point? The issue is very complicated. Because if there is a hypersensitivity, there is a, there is a possibility of a trouble. Now, uh, if, you, if, you were, if you have ever been trying to solve a conflict between two parties or two individuals who argue with each other, it's very difficult to mediate because if you try to tell this one that he is not he's uh, he's not right you will be put in the corner of the enemy of this person if there is a conflict there is always this danger what i now what i challenge uh, what what the challenge is if we criticize if somebody criticizes israel over like uh, their treatment of the Palestinian, he may be uh, he might be assigned to a corner of those who are against Jewish people. So just uh, we need to keep it in mind that it can be received by the Jewish people as sign of hostility. You see, you see what I mean. Any thoughts, comments on that? So, would you think it would be best to leave any criticism of Israel to Israel herself rather than even geopolitically? I know we talked a bit about differentiating between geopolitical national Israel and ethnic Israel as a whole across the world, but in any, in any sector, do you think it's better, especially for Gentiles, to leave that to... Um, to Jews and Israelis, and then uh, kind of let God handle his business? Well, uh, it would be the easiest, but I'm not sure that uh, it's possible and it's, uh, that it's, 
As I mentioned before, if something is wrong, we should name it. But we should do it in the way to bring peace, restoration, redemption, and healing. The problem is, or the challenge is, that naming things by their names, things that are wrong, or at least from our perspective, we run a risk that it's just our perspective and that's, uh, that it will be received by the one we are talking to in a completely different way, not the way we want. Instead of serving for peace, it would uh, be a sign of hostility. It could per be perceived as a sign of hostility. So the issue is pretty complicated. That's really no different than when Christians exercise discernment um, or righteous anger or judgment against other Christians. Um, it can also be perceived that way if it's not done in love. And as we look at the nation of Israel, is it, uh, we know that it's becoming more and more secular all the time. We know that there's, uh, there's talk of corruption in the government at the highest levels. Um, is it okay to exercise godly discernment um, and, and look at those situations and, um, I don't like the word being criticized, but, but, uh, but at least recognize that uh, these trends and some of their problems are, are wrong in, in uh, godly ways. Yeah, but discernment, absolutely, you're right. But the discernment has to be exercised on many different levels. There are many dimensions for this discernment. It includes not just theological, not just biblical, uh, but also conflict and uh, relationships and in, uh, interhuman relationship. It includes culture and even more important, it includes the history that impacts, uh, in, impacts what, uh, what we're talking about. So it's, it's very complicated. <laughs> just today, I mentioned to a, uh, to a Jewish person that I'm going to speak about this subject. Is criticizing Israel anti-Semitic? And the answer of this Jewish person was instant. Sure it is. And I just like, yes, but you know, no, it is anti-Semitism, no, no doubts. And then I talked to, um, uh, to, uh, to like a German Gentile person. Is, it, uh, is criticizing Israel anti-Semitic? Surely not. <laughs> so it's, uh, and again, I, <laughs> and I would, I would imagine that I would ask some Gentiles, Christians, and they would say criticizing Israel is no go. For example, uh, in two weeks, I'm, uh, I'm participating in a meeting or gathering of leaders of different pro -is Christian pro-Israel organizations. And I'm sure that those people, they would say that criticizing Israel, you should, you should stay away from that. But at the same time, I can go to some convention of, uh, of Jewish people and they would say that criticizing Israel is, yeah, Israel is wrong. It's so diverse. And, but if we hold it up against the standard, the, the moral standards of God's law and what the Bible teaches us, right is right and wrong is wrong. And whether it's Jewish or Gentile or whatever group you want to talk about, uh, pointing out or at least recognizing when things are not correct, um, I think is, is, we're called to do that. You see, um, right, but, yes, but, always. Uh, this, uh, a challenge is, we tend to decide for ourselves what is wrong 
and what is right. We even claim that many that everything in the Bible is uh, either right or wrong, white or black. But as uh, as you Mar uh, Mark should know, usually when I presenting the Jewish way of thinking, I say uh, I say that uh, one and the same thing can be white and black at the at the very same time, because not everything is white and not everything is black, and it's not gray. It's just like wrong and right it all it can also depend on the perspective and perspective what people are looking at for example building uh, new settlements uh, in israel on palestinian so-called palestinian territories or so-called occupied territories i mean some call these territories uh, re like uh, redeemed territories, some call them occupied territories. Like from one perspective, if you ask why you are building these settlements, there will be all tons of good reasons. And then you will ask the opposite side and they would give you all tons of reasons why it's wrong. And then you go back to this side and they will tell you uh, all the responses to that side and back and forth. So who is right and who is wrong? And there is a, this uh, very uh, Jewish, uh, that, that Jewish joke that you probably know, I told that several times, but it's not a joke, a Jewish type of thinking. Two men come, uh, have conflict, they come to a Jewish rabbi Jew, uh, and uh, present their case. So the first uh, presents his case and the Jewish rabbi uh, says after listening, yes, you're right. And the second uh, then says, how can, I, can he be right? How can you say that? I have not presented my case yet. And the rabbi says, oh, well, present your case now. And he presents his case. And after that, rabbi says, uh, the rabbi says to him, you're right. And then uh, a, a student of a rabbi, of the rabbi asks him, rabbi, how can it, how can it be possible at all that both of them, they contradict to each other and both of them are right. It's not possible. And then Rabbi looks at his disciple and he says, you're right. And, uh, and it's not a joke. It's the reality we're dealing with. I mean, there are different perspectives to look at, uh, at, some, at some things. You know, the, uh, if, if we would be more, it's like, it's fun discussion about everything, even in, including the kosher food. Uh, can you eat pork or not? So I can present the case, uh, the case that you shouldn't, and then I will present the case against my case. So it's uh, there, there, especially when it it goes uh, uh, when it speaks about conflicts between people. It's very loaded. It's very complicated. It needs much sensibility, love, respect patience, etc. And uh, if somebody criticizes Israel, it made it like generally, it might not be necessary anti-Semitism. For the one who criticizes Israel, it probably he or she doesn't even think any hosti uh, hostility toward uh, Jewish people. But for the Jewish people, it can be received as anti-Semitism. You see the point? Something what you don't think that it's anti-Semitic, it doesn't uh, mean automatically that it's not going to be received as a hostil hostility by the people you're talking to or in the presence of whom you're talking about. I um would under I to give like my perspective. Growing up, I was raised, you know, in in a Western American church, and um, didn't realize like what I had been taught was primarily New Testament, and I didn't hear a lot of theology being taught within the American church about the the importance of of Israel being God's chosen people, and so me growing up. Um, I didn't even understand the difference between a Jew and a Gentile. I really like honestly completely oblivious did not recognize that because I was just looking at, you know, Romans 11, where it talks about the Gentiles being grafted in. And um, 
unfortunately, I think that has been translated in churches to to come across as replacement in a sense of, you know, like, oh, well, see, because of Jews, you've become just like them. Um, and, and that's not what it's saying at all. You know, it says, you know, now if their trespass means riches for the world and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Um, so, I mean, of course, I'd love to hear more of your thoughts on that. But, you know, growing up, people would say, pray for Israel. And I would be like, okay, cool. Is that because that's where Jesus came from? Like, why are we praying for Israel? Completely out of miseducation. So I think that people can, like you said, um, criticize Israel without even knowing it because of ignorance. And so now I would agree with more, you know, like what Michael is saying, that just the inclusion, um, the importance of understanding that the Israelites are God's chosen people and that it's okay that there is favorite. And I think the problem is like, even with reading Romans 11 is that we read that and we wanna also be the favorite. And as an American mentality, we have a mentality that says we are the best, you know? So to read the scripture and realize we're not his chosen people. We, it's to the Jews first, you know, like his chosen people come first. And I think that that's the place for us to like, kind of humble ourselves and go, we're not the favorite and that's okay. <laughs> well, and um, I'm preaching through Galatians in a church and, um, you know, Galatians is mostly Gentile, but they had the Judaizers try to sneak in and tell them it's not enough just to believe in Jesus. You uh, have to be circumcised also. And a lot of them were falling for it. But like in chapter three, you know, where Paul goes back to the Old Testament and we hear him talk about the blessings of Abraham, how they go to the Gentiles. So the Gentiles are experiencing the full blessings of Israel through Abraham. Where, you know, if you're uh, like, I mean, if you're Gentile, then you'd be spiritually a descendant of Abraham. But, you know, right now, the, those blessings are going to mostly Gentiles. Well, Thank you, uh, Jesse. Thank you, Michael. It's, uh, it's Jesse, particularly, it's humbling for me to hear what you just said. It's, uh, I really, I do really appreciate that. At the same time, uh, I want to emphasize that you're also chosen. Uh, I just recently uh, read uh, well, somebody uh, like uh, somebody with a theological degree, uh, my good friend here in Germany, he got in some uh, some he got some emotional probably troubles with his face. It's uh, it's difficult for him to read the Bible now. He's like he's not coming to reading the Bible, but he wants to do that. So I made a commitment with him to read, like to, we meet, uh, he lives in another city, but we meet one, uh, once, uh, once a week and we discuss the Bible uh, to, uh, to get, uh, together. So recently we read, uh, last week we read through the book of Ephesians. There is nothing new under the sun in the book of Ephesians for me. I did exegeticals while at DTS and I read it many times. But it was such a refreshing reminder for me that I was chosen in him before the creation of the world. Jesse, you, you shouldn't be Jewish to be chosen. Even before the creation of the world, God loves you so much. He placed you in heaven, in, in, in Yeshua, in Jesus. So it's, uh, it's so nice. It's so just, even for me as a Jew, it's so humbling that the wall of partition is not uh, there any longer. He brings, uh, he brings us together. So I would say, according to the book of Ephesians and according to what Yeshua, Jesus did, we all are chosen. I mean, there are different uh, ways to be chosen. There are different purposes to be chosen. But, uh, but in Yeshua, in Jesus, we have tremendous advantages. 
He created the world for us, actually. He, created, he shaped his plan for us to be in heaven, according to the book of Ephesians. Why I said about my friend, uh, he asked, uh, he, the main thing that he noticed there was that it's about like, it's a dilemma. How could we chosen? And at the same time, why not God did it in a different way? Why should somebody be chosen? And why should it be so complicated if he has chosen? Why not to save immediately or instantly everybody or whatever? Why the, all this play? And I said, listen, it's not what the book Ephesians is about. It shows his grace, how important you are as Jew or Gentile. And the second half of this is how to live with that. Why I'm telling that all? Um, just because it's very humbling to hear what Jesse said. And I want to remind all of us that actually we all chosen in Yeshua. It doesn't compromise Israel as the chosen people. It doesn't compromise the Jewish essence of the gospel. It doesn't compromise to the Jew first principle. And it doesn't compromise the fact that the future kingdom is Jewish kingdom that is open for everybody. But now, uh, in order to round up our discussion some, uh, theologically, I think that it's impossible not to notice that the land was promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The land belongs to the Jewish people in the, uh, as the eternal possession. More than that, uh, Jesus in his teaching, he says that uh, one of the evidences or proof for the, for the resurrection of dead is that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are still to receive this land because they died before they entered the land, but they should receive it. And, the Lord, and that's why he said, God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God is the God of living, not the dead. He used the formula that is attached to the promise of the land, actually. So uh, the land of Israel, and as Michael Pro I think it was Michael uh, rightly pointed that from the sea through the river, it covers the huge Middle Eastern region, not this small piece of land that is called Israel now, but the huge land. It belongs, uh, it belongs to Israel uh, in, and to the Jewish people in God's plan. Uh, so Jewish people, they have a eschatological right for, uh, for that. Those who have that Israel needs to come into obedience to receive it, they are probably right because Israel is going to have it in the state of the Messianic kingdom, namely the state of the, of in the, on the condition of the full righteousness. So, but the land belongs to the, Jew, uh, to the Jewish people as promised land. And uh, what we have right now, it's a small piece of this land. Now, let me shift the gear and show you uh, something what you probably know, the importance of this land for the Jewish people. If, you're, uh, if you have your uh, Bibles somewhere available in whatever format, digital or printed, uh, let's, uh, let, me, let me point your attention to some uh, passages from, particularly from the Old Testament. There is a passage uh, that is used even uh, at the ved weddings, Jewish wedding ceremonies. That's why we break the, uh, the glass, a, a bridegroom uh, breaks the glass at the end of the uh, wedding ceremony. It's in Psalm 137. And I, uh, and I read from, uh, from verse 5 through, well, and verse 6. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, may my right hand forget her skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. 
if I do not remember you, if I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. Now you see that, that how important is Jerusalem and Israel for the Jewish people. It's recited during the sorrow, it's recited during the highest joy as the wedding. This, uh, this particular passage. Another passage, uh, it's, it's better, probably better know. Vladimir, yes. yeah, why, do you, why do you smash the cup then? Is it based on this passage? Sorry? Why do you smash the cup at the wedding? Is it based on this passage? Because yes, it's based on this uh, on this passage, because we remember Jerusalem that Jerusalem is still uh, not uh, not in complete peace. So we uh, we remember that the temple is destroyed, uh, still not re uh, it's still not rebuilt. So it's like remember in the on the top of our joy, we just got married. You can kiss your wife. You're just like, it's such a, the pinnacle of joy. And on this pinnacle of joy, you've got to break, uh, to break the glass. Why? Because on the pinnacle of joy, according to this psalm, you are to remember Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is, not, is still not at peace. So can you see the importance of Jerusalem and Israel for the Jewish people, even in this psalm? And you can find many passages like this. Let's look at the psalm that is better familiar for Christians, uh, like Psalm 122 and uh, from verse 6 in uh, English translation. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. May peace be within your walls and prosperity within your pal uh, palaces. For the sake of my brothers and my friends, I will now say, may peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. It's through the, uh, through the verse nine. So you, uh, you see the importance of Jerusalem. It's a part of our uh, constant prayer. So. If you look at the Jewish liturgy, like daily liturgy, weekly liturgy, cele uh, celebratory uh, liturgy, feast uh, liturgy, in the Jewish prayer book in Sidur, we constantly remember Jerusalem. We constantly pray for the land to be restored, for the, to, for the Messiah to come, in our case, to come back and to restore the peace in the, uh, of the land. The land in Jerusalem is core of our identity, core of our religion, core of our belief system. It's at the core of our worldview. You see my point? Just if you touch something related to the Jewish, uh, to, uh, to Jerusalem or to, Isra uh, to Israel, you touch the very heart of the Jewish worldview. With other words, it's the chance that it will be perceived and received as insult or uh, hostility or anti-Semitism is high, very high. So be careful. Let me uh, let me read uh, another uh, another passage in uh, in this regard, uh, and it's uh, in Daniel chapter six. Uh, from verse 10 or verse 10. Now, when Daniel knew that the document was signed, he entered his house, now in his roof chamber, he had windows opened over Jerusalem and he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God as he had been doing previously. Now, what direction he uh, was he praying? Have you noticed that? He was praying toward Jerusalem. That's why every time Jewish people pray, I mean, religious Jews, if the Jewish people pray in, uh, in some direction, then not just like this in heaven, not just like this with closed eyes, but we pray toward, toward Jerusalem. All synagogues are designed for us to pray toward Jerusalem. Now, can you imagine 
this geopolitical, this geographic location is at the core of our identity related to prayer, related to, uh, to direction. And, it, and I'm talking uh, about the diaspora. In the diaspora, in the dispersion outside of Israel, we pray toward Israel. I have even uh, an app on my phone that points toward, uh, toward Israel. And it's, uh, I tell you all this just to emphasize for the Jewish people, if you speak against Jerusalem, Israel, or criticizing that, you enter something what is hypersensitive. So, uh, is criticizing Israel anti-Semitism? It's probably from case to case different, but it can be perceived as anti-Semitism and hostility by the Jewish people, big deal. And that's my conclusion for today. Dr. Pickman, would you encourage even Gentiles to pray facing Jerusalem? <laughs> Is that a good question? That's a, that's a good question, tough question. I don't yeah. want to give an answer on this question now because it, it, may, it, might, it might be misinterpreted and start a completely different uh, discussion, okay? But okay. very good point. And if you join, if you Maybe it's a point for us to talk a little bit on our Monday meetings, uh, or maybe a point for another brown bag. Sure, that sounds but, good. But thank you, it's an excellent question. Sorry for not having enough time okay. and chutzpah to answer your question right now. Awesome. I just, want, I just want to just make one last quick comment. I know we're running out of time, but basically scripture always talks about my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge, and I know in the Tanakh, making reference to the people of Israel, the sons of Israel. Um, but that still stands true as a principle for all people that are God's people. And I just think one, when you were referring to all the complexity of this issue, that there's so much to consider, but so much theology in terms of, we're talking now about the church, not the world. Um, so much theology has been driven by uh, some of the spiritualizing of the promises of the Tanakh and the way that as you were referring back to that intro Jewish conflict that they were arguing among themselves and the church teaches and always points oh bad Pharisee bad Pharisee and people don't have a context to understand what that really means and they almost make it okay we're going to be against Jews we're going to be against any form of uh, Judaism and so it is just such a complex issue. And then you go back, of course, to most of the literature that whenever I want to do, whenever I, I wanted to do research in what I'm interested in, I have to discern because a lot of the great commentaries are reformed. And so in a lot of reformed literature, not that the, I disagree with other theology, but this idea of replacement theology, yes, you can nuance it among different scholars. Nevertheless, there's this thing like Israel's no longer impart, important. We shouldn't be for Jew or Israel because of that. So that's so deep seated in the church that a lot of people don't realize where it's coming from, but it's so much a part of us. So we go back, we need to educate, we need to be humble and we need to discern. That was basically it. Abs absolutely. I agree with that. And again, what I want to emphasize in addition to that, a like human factor. Jewish people, we are people and we are humans and uh, there is an emotional and historic bias that we have in, our, in ourselves. And this bias is related to Israel, related to, uh, to Jerusalem. And beyond all theological discussions on, in this regard, for thousands of years, our forefathers were praying for the peace of Jerusalem, were remembering Jerusalem. They were thinking and longing, thinking of and longing for in gathering in this uh, land under the leadership of the Messiah. So if 
you touch this issue. It's very touchy. It's very touchy one. It's probably the second touchy, uh, touchiest issue after the Holocaust. Uh, and that's why be very careful in what you say, in how you say it. Think of, uh, of the way people will receive it. For Arabs, for Muslims, this land and this city would never play such role as for the Jewish people. So just keep it in mind and uh, communicate well with this in mind. I need, I, need to come, uh, I need to come to the end because our time is uh, over. I already over time. Dana, it's great to see you uh, with us as well. Good. Oh, it's Good been wonderful, you. Vladimir. I've been listening. It's great. I know. I miss I... you. I hope you'll be in Dallas soon. Oh, uh, well, one day, one day soon, we will uh, share a real lunch together. So I invite you all when I, <laughs> when I will be able to uh, enter United States again. Yes. Come to Bangkok. Yeah.